I am Margarita, and welcome Keith Alot to our fundraising banquet. Hey, we have a volunteer here from Timview High. Thanks for showing up. And this is our, our event right here. The uh, Not just tacos, we have uh, Mexican cuisine tonight. And here's who's already showing up tonight. Why don't you sit with the Rascoans over here? <laughs> Guest speaker. Again, a round of applause for the I can always, uh, I'll be willing to speak anywhere for a good Mexican meal. So that's, that's always nice to be able to have that. Well, again, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity that I have to be able to be here. Just so you have a little bit of my background in regards to the television industry and that kind of thing. I graduated from BYU, actually, right here. So it was 20 years ago, 1991, when I graduated. I've been in the broadcast journalism business now for 20 years and uh, been all over the country and in different places. We've worked in San Diego, Fresno, Los Angeles, Denver, and so many cities. So we've been around a little bit, moving the family here and there. My wife and I, my, my beautiful wife here, uh, Bonnie, we have five uh, children. Uh, we have a son that just returned from an LDS mission. Uh, he's 22 now. Or 20, what is he, 23? 22, yeah. And uh, a daughter that's just about ready to get married. And uh, so it's kind of exciting for us just to get married in another month. So it's been very stressful at the house. There's been a lot of uh, weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. But other than that, uh, it's been good. I've just kind of been sitting back and, and Bonnie's been doing with the, the, the emotions, but that's kind of interesting. Then we have a son of 16, and then we have a uh, twin daughters that are 12 years old. And so we stay very busy, and especially with uh, me, as, as he mentioned, as, as the LDS bishop, uh, it's been a great opportunity for me. We have a big ward, and there's a lot of issues, and one of the families that I was just going to be talking a little bit about tonight, in fact, are the Jameses and that report. But I hope I can just share with you a few things when it comes to what we can do with our lives as far as service and, 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 and leadership and helping out others. Because I think sometimes we look at our own lives and, they, and we really think, what can we do? I mean, what can we really do? Because I'm just one. I'm only one. And, and really not one person can do a whole lot. And I guess some of the stories I want to share with you is that one person can do a whole lot. And, and, there's, and there's things that happen in people's lives sometimes that put them in circumstances that require them almost to be able to kind of get out of their shell or whatever it may be. And they start making a difference in this world and it kind of snowballs a little bit. Now again, I, I just barely met Neil also uh, a short time ago. I haven't known him for very long in regards to, he came over because like he said, he was friends with the Jamesons that live in my ward there. but. Um, I, I, I looked at the video that they're doing here, and I've been, had a chance to be able to talk to them a little bit about that. And what a neat thing! I, I think it goes to show you, uh, you know, the difference that they're trying to make in individual lives. You know, Mexico City. My parents were just called on an LDS mission to Mexico City, Mexico, and they're down there right now. And I mean, I've never been there, but they say it is just crazy the number of people. Right? I guess. What how many people are in Mexico City? I mean, 20, over 20 million. 23, 23. 23 million people. There are 3 million people here in the whole state of Utah. I mean, so basically, you're looking at a place there that's, uh, you know, 10 Utahs, you know, practically, down in one city. So you think about this organization and what they're doing, you think, well, what difference are they really going to make? You got 20 million, 23 million people down there. What difference is it really going to make if you help out one, two, three, four, a dozen, you know, 20 or more kids? But it starts somewhere. And I guess that's what the stories that I want to talk to you a little bit about. I guess, you know, when it comes to service or it comes to helping out other people, I think I came from a family that I was taught well. I had great parents, uh, especially my father in regards to just always noticing people that were 
kind of a need in helping out. I come from a rather big family where there's nine kids, five brother, uh, five sisters, four, four boys, and uh, I'm the third oldest in there. And I'll never forget as a kid, we grew up um, in Denver, Colorado, just outside of Denver. And I remember we used to go to this park all the time as a family, it was a great park. And we'd go and bring our picnic, and my mom would always cook up some great fried chicken, and I love that and everything. Of course, she made some mean Mexican food, too, but it was nice when we had a little bit of a change from the beans. I used to complain all the time, because all we ate were beans and rice. And I said, Are we, can't we eat something different now? All I want is beans and rice. So it's kind of, <laughs> see, kids, so enjoy it right now, you know? So, <laughs> but I remember being at a park, and I remember um, uh, there was this guy that uh, just kind of looked, kind of by himself, and um, I remember my dad going up and, and talking to this guy, and before I knew it, he was sitting at our table, and he was eating our food, and I was kind of like, what's going on, why, why is, and I realized, here was a guy that was at the park, he had no food, he was hungry, didn't have anywhere to go, and my dad just kind of brought him in, and, and, and I guess it was examples like that that quick me, quickly made me realize that, you know what? There's more to life than just worrying about myself. There's more to life than, than just being, thinking about myself in that regard. You know, sometimes, you know, at, at Channel 2 News, I mean, it's a big newsroom. We got a lot of people. Obviously, not everybody's a member of the LDS faith. Some of you may not be a member of the LDS faith. And I don't want to turn this into, you know, a church talk here or anything like that. But what I'm saying is that a lot of times people at the, at the station, they, they know I'm a bishop then. And they know that I, you know, they don't understand really what a bishop does and everything like that. And, and the question I always get asked is, well, first of all, they ask, well, how many people do you have in your congregation? I say, well, about 410, 420 people in my in the congregation that I receive. And, and they're like, how do you how do you do that? You know, how how do you do how do you juggle your job, which is full time, and you're traveling a lot, and you're on the air, and you're here and there, and then also your family, five kids and everything, and then also the bishop work. How do you do that? How do you manage to be able to do that? And I guess the answer that I, I, I don't know, to be honest with you, I don't know how I do it. Any of you who have ever been in leadership positions, but you realize when you begin to help other people, and when you begin to be able to live with other people and change other people's lives, an amazing, things ha an amazing thing happens. Suddenly, you yourself are energized. You yourself have more time to be able to get done what needs to be done. I don't know how it works. I don't know how I'm able to do what I do. But I know that when I'm faithful and I do those things and I serve other people, my life, somehow, I find the time and it works out. You know, last night I emceed a, a big event uh, at the Little um, America, and it was um, it was a Utah Minority Bar Association. They've been in operation for about 20 years now, and I just wanted to focus on one of the individuals there that I thought shows you that one person can make a difference in this life. Uh, a little Japanese man, 80 years old, just uh, Judge Raymond Uno is what his name is, a former judge. Uh, just 12 years old is when World War II hit. Of course, you all remember Pearl Harbor and, and all that. And, and what happened to all the Japanese people here in Utah when that happened? Well, they were taken and they were put in concentration camps. And so he spent three years with his family in a concentration camp. So basically, they almost, in many ways, they, they, they gathered up all the Japanese people because they didn't really know, you know, whether or not what to do with them, really. And so here he was in a concentration camp as a dishwasher. He worked as a dishwasher at 14 years old. And his father ended up dying in camp when he was 12 years old. And, and to hear his story of what happened in his life is pretty amazing because when he was 17, he signed up to serve in the military. So the very military that took him and almost imprisoned him, he turns around and says, you know what? I'm not going to sit here and be upset about everything. I'm going to go and serve this country that I still believe in America. I love America. This is where I'm, I, I am. So he goes and serves in the military and, and has all these honors. And then he comes back and gets into law school. And then he starts becoming you know, a lawyer and a judge and starts making a difference with the very Constitution you know, that he was fighting to, to preserve and those kind of things. 
But what was interesting is, 20 years ago, he thought, you know what? There's a lot of kids out there that are underprivileged that don't have an opportunity to be able to get into law and get in to be able to make a difference in these areas. And so why don't we organize something here, this association to help give scholarships to these kids that are, are come from you know, minority homes <coughs> and be able to help them to be able to, you know, because many of them came from broken homes and other things like that, to where he thought it'd be a great idea to be able to get his instruction. Well, by and by, he was able to round up judges, get attorneys interested. It was interesting to see the video that they kind of put together on their uh, association because it showed very clearly that many judges were kind of skeptical, kind of like, well, what, what is this? Or, 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 or attorneys that were, that were being asked to get involved, they're kind of like, I don't know. I mean, what difference am I going to really make? And what difference is this organization going to make? But really, it was that grassroots organization started 20 years ago, and, and you know, year after year, it grew and grew. Well, last night, it filled the whole ballroom at the Little America and had a great presentation. Monty was there, and it was a great event. And guess how much they gave out in scholarship? $33,000. They gave out in scholarships to young men and young women who were wanting to go into and become attorneys and lawyers. Now you may say, why waste your money on lawyers? <laughs> That's not a good thing, but no. This was a great opportunity for them to be able to have some great opportunities to be able to get into law, which they would have not been able to have, some scholarships they were not able to have. Another example is uh, the very Jameson, what, what Neil talked about there. The Jameson family, Chris and Alva Jameson, they live right across the street. Uh, it, was, it was many years ago when they decided to move into our, the house right next door to us. We heard about this family that had adopted 35 special needs kids, and they were moving in right across the street. And you could only imagine what the neighborhood was going through. Everybody was freaking out going, oh no. What's going to happen here? We're going to be constantly being bothered. We're going to be constantly being asked to do this, and they're going to need help with this and that and everything like that. Well, they move in, and an amazing thing happens. This family, the way that they operate and the way that they, they structured themselves just amazed us all. They had 17, I think, 17 kids living at home when they moved in. And some of them are all the special needs kids are at, def at different levels. So you have some that are in wheelchairs that are just pretty much they can't talk, they can't do that. And then others that are, uh, you know, pretty functional. I mean, they can pretty much do a lot of things on their own. So what they do there is basically they look at the individuals, okay, and they kind of say, okay, you're in charge. You know, they'll take one girl and they'll say, okay, uh, you're in charge of these two girls here, these, these sisters. And then you know, they'll take another kid. Okay, Zach, you're in charge of these boys. And uh, Matthew, you're over here. You're in charge here. And then what an amazing thing happens in regards to inside that home is that you go inside that home and it is always just clean. It is organized. They go to bed at a certain time. They wake up at a certain time. They, if you ever you go in there at night, you see all the bowls lined up. I mean, there's like 17 bowls and all the cereal, Mark, and it just, it, it's, like, it's run, it's just amazing what they're able to do and how they're able to do it. And instead of them being a burden on the neighborhood, wow, they're a blessing to our neighborhood. I mean, it was amazing to be able to see because if any of you have ever been around special needs kids and really gotten to know them, and really getting gotten to uh, be able to dive into their lives, you will quickly realize that they bless your mind because of who they are and what they're able to accomplish with the limited amount of uh, abilities that they have. Now, they've lost several children because of their abilities. But you look at these kids and you realize, wow, here's one woman making a difference. Well, one woman and one man in regards to he passed away a short time ago. 
And that was really tragic because she was left kind of on her own, but with help, she's been able to manage the children. But here's one woman making a difference in people's lives. Even though it may not be huge, we're not talking about thousands of kids. We're talking about 35 kids. The amazing thing for me as a bishop was when I conducted that funeral, to see all these kids come back and to see them gather around and to see their lives and where they're at in their lives because of two people who decided to make a difference. A little 80-year-old Japanese guy decided, you know what? Yeah, I have a lot of hours on my schedule. I'm a judge, I'm an attorney, but I can help out. Last night, he ended up helping out dozens of kids, young men and young women, with thousands of dollars in scholarships that started with just one, one man. Uh, in uh, February, February 12th of 2009, Yeah, it was the evening of February 12, 2007. Uh, Jeff Walker and his son, AJ, were at the Trolley Square. And they were shopping for Valentine's Day gifts and everything. And many of you have heard about this uh, tragic story in regards to suddenly shots ring out and five people are gunned down and four people are injured, five people killed. It's a Trolley Square disaster. It's one of the worst mall shootings that ever has happened here in Utah. Um, Vicki Walker, the wife, saw it unfold on the news. And we were covering, of course, this awful story. And uh, Vicki Walker was watching this unfold, and she knew that her husband and her son were there at Trolley Square. And she's calling, she's calling, and she's dialing, and no answer. And she says, when she's recounting this story now, she says, I just knew something. I just knew they weren't around or something. Well, sure enough, her husband was shot dead, and her son, 19-year-old son, was shot and injured in such a way where he was in critical condition. Uh, several, uh, basically, the shooter had a shotgun, and so you had several of the pellets enter his head. He was rushed to the hospital. Um, I got to know uh, Vicki Walker pretty closely because I did several stories with her, and I did several stories and interviews on the situation. And you know, Vicki, the reason why I'm telling you this story is because it made me realize what one person did. What one person did to make a difference. Vicki Walker lost her husband, and she nearly lost her 19-year-old son. Her 19-year-old son is back, and he's pretty much, you look at him, you never know that anything happened. He's a little slower. I remember doing a story where he couldn't even read. He couldn't even he was ABC. He had little blocks where he was trying to put them in an order of A, B, C, D, and those kind of things. So his his progress was very slow. It's been you know this was 2007 when this happened. So we're talking about four years ago. Um, but Vicki Walker could have gone and locked herself up in a room and kind of just throw herself underneath the covers and just kind of give up on life, saying, you know what? What good is it? But, you know, my, I lost my husband. I nearly lost my son. I had to spend months and years working with my son. And, and then eventually, also, she even lost her home because of the situation that was involved with, uh, you know, the finances and the cost of everything. She didn't have a husband anymore at work. I mean, she had some really difficult and trying times. But the amazing thing is about Vicki Walker that to this day, I don't know if any of you have seen some of the news reports on her, new thing, but she started a new thing called Circle the Wagons. And what Circle the Wagons is, is what she realized when that tragedy happened, there was very little resources for her to go to. I mean, you, you just lost a loved one. You've got another person in the hospital. What do you do? Who do you call? What resources are available? She had no idea that there were organizations actually that would help people or wives that lost husbands in shootings or something like that that had like scholarship type things or grants or those kind of things. You had no idea that there was other things available like that. 
So she decided to put together this, what they called circle the wagons, which as you know, whenever the pioneers, you know, kind of got under attack, they would circle the wagons, you band together, and that helped protect you. So she started this organization where she's now working with the Salt Lake City Police Department, Salt Lake City Fire Department, things like that, whenever there's a tragedy in other uh, 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 police and fire departments, agencies. So whenever there's a disaster or some kind of thing that happens where somebody loses someone or something like that, she there's a little uh, uh, kind of a, it's, it's almost like a really nice little can that is given to that individual that has different items in there and resources on who to call and where to go and all those things. So here's one woman, and now she's speaking in groups. She's going out and giving her story in regards to helping others. She's helping those that have been involved in tragedies. Um, and, and, and she was just you know, featured just a short time ago. She was at uh, a big convention where they were having her speak in regards to helping out those that have experienced maybe similar events. So again, here's one woman a difference in a lot of people's lives. Taking that opportunity because she could have just kind of hid from it all. She could have just kind of gone on the wayside there and said, you know what? Life has dealt with me this way and I can't handle life this way. So I'm going to go kind of hide myself and just kind of disappear a little bit. No. She decided to make a difference. And one of the things that I asked her, I said, you know, why this? Why this? And what do you think your answer was? Because when I help people and when I help others change their lives, it makes my life so much better. So really, I guess my message is think about what we can do to help other people. Even though it may be small, it doesn't have to be huge. Right here, we have a room full of not, you know, it's not hundreds of people here, but that's where it starts. Grassroots efforts is where it starts in helping make the difference in people's lives. Uh, you had talked about um, the, in regards to just going after a couple children, right? And helping them, and as you help those children, then they help someone, and they, and then they can help someone, and it kind of just snowballs, and that makes a difference. So yes, there are millions of people out there in need. Yes, there are millions of kids, unfortunately, that are on the streets, especially in Mexico City. But it's, it has to start somewhere. It has to begin somewhere. Um, from last night, I got this little book here that they gave me in regards to just some quotes about uh, you know, just making a difference in, in, in your life. This one here, Lou Austin. You are here for a purpose. There is not a duplicate of you in the whole wide world. There never has been. There never will be. You were brought here now to fill a certain need. Take time to consider what it might be. This one here, Mother Teresa. If we have not peace, it is because we have forgotten that we belong to each other. Let me just uh, conclude my remarks by just saying, I think for anyone who serves, I mean, whether it be an LDS mission or you serve in the Peace Corps or you serve, you talk to anybody who's done something or they've gone to another country or they've even done something here, they've gone to the inner city or they've built something or they've, done something to change somebody's life, they always say, it was one of the greatest experiences of my life. And I guarantee you, it wasn't easy. It wasn't great because it was easy. It wasn't great because it was fun, necessarily. It wasn't great because it was, you know, you're partying and dancing and singing and all that other stuff. It was great because you were helping somebody else. And there is a great peace that comes into our lives when we help other people. You know, my job as a journalist, sometimes we get a bad rap, and rightfully so. Sometimes we consider vultures and we go after them. The doom and gloom. And you watch the nightly news, and a lot of it is doom and gloom, unfortunately. You're right. 
But you know, as a journalist still, I look at my job and I think, you know, I can still try to help other people and change people's lives by being able to get to know them and being able to meet them and being able to tell their story. And hopefully a story like Vicki Walker's can inspire someone else. And that person could be inspired by somebody else. Hopefully a story like Judge Raymond Uno can inspire somebody else of what he did. I did a story on the Jameson points, just to kind of show what these folks have done. Hopefully a story like that can inspire and change someone else to help out other people. Thank you again for letting me have the opportunity to come and speak here. I appreciate being with each one of you. And I just want to close my, my remarks by saying the greatest joy that I have and the greatest satis satisfaction I have is when I'm able to help someone. And that's, I think, what makes all the difference in the world. Thank you very much. We have been deeply blessed and honored to have such a great speaker with us. Uh, not just a spiritual giant, but an orator. And not every day we can hear somebody speak. We can really deliver a great message with finesse and eloquence. And thank you very much. Let's, uh, I want to introduce uh, the cook. Miguel, will you stand up, please? Thank you. We want to thank you. He, he started cooking last night. I think he spent most of the day. Uh, the, the young ladies and gentlemen are from uh, Tim Pugh High School. They're helping out, helping their host tonight. Want to give them a hand? Give them a hand. I won't take much time to get into our experiences, because we could be here for hours, and I'm not telling you what we have experienced. Uh, especially with some of the great leaders that we have met down here. But going back to uh, Bishop Rascone, in his business, he meets the most interesting people in the world every day. And he hears the most amazing stories. I think that's what makes his, uh, his career so exciting. In my case, I don't meet so many interesting people every day, but I know that when I go down, when I, when I'm with Margarita, we go to Mexico or Columbia, we visit these shelters, we meet the most amazing people. And when you get to talk to these kids and these leaders, you can hear the most amazing stories. That's why we invite you to know more about what we do and get involved. So instead of spending too much time on describing the leaders and things, we mainly want to bring it down to the kids. Because kids are the future. They're the ones who will be the next generation's leaders. And if we can inspire them and enable them to become really truly effective leaders. The amount of good that they can do is, is un unimaginable. And as Bishop Rascone was saying, if one kid helps several kids, and those kids go on to helping many others, it becomes exponential. So that's what we have learned. One of the great things we've learned from our humanitarian work in Mexico is that these shelters they're effective because they're, they're producing leaders. They're producing kids who don't want to just be taken care of. They don't want to just be fed or clothed. They want to escape the street. They want a better life. And in doing so, they want to help others. They want to bring others of their friends, brothers and sisters, their peers with them. And so even though they have been doing this sort of practice for years and years, didn't really have a name until I got to examine it and look into it. And I thought, well, you know, these leaders, what are they? They're beacons. They're beacons of light, of love, of hope. And so I thought, if they're beacons, then who are they attracting? They're attracting the other ones who aren't quite so bright. OK? A kid on the street, a kid who has no family, has no hopes in life. But he has a spirit. He has a life, and he has a human dignity. Maybe not as pronounced as the leader, as the uh, advocate, but he has a life. So I see these kids as candles flickering in the wind. They need help. They need protection. And they need food, nor they to grow. But when they're given the chance to grow, what happens with a, a match, or with a flame? Can you can you measure how? large a fire can get, you can't. It's, it's impossible to measure. So what they need is the opportunity to expand. Now, 
The reason that a lot of these advocates that we work with in Mexico and Colombia are so effective is that they inspire these kids to become what they're meant to become, to overcome their handicaps, their spiritual, emotional, physical handicaps. And these kids, are they become examples to the other kids living in the street, and the kids with addiction, and the kids with problems. So I came up with the term streetlights. Because if you're on a dark street somewhere, in a dark city, in a bad neighborhood, what you want more than anything else is a light. You want a street light. And that's the first place you're going to go. And so these are like street lights, because you notice that the other little kids kind of gravitate to them. And they trust them, they respect them. See, these, we're talking about kids who have been victimized. When you're victimized, what happens? You lose trust in others, you lose faith in others, you lose hope. And it's a very hard thing to reestablish trust. You've been victimized. Not everybody can help someone who's lost trust in life, and trust in others. These kids have that capacity, these streetlights, because the kids will trust them. They know that they have overcome these challenges. They know that what they have achieved is also possible for them. So that's inspiring for us. So we created a program called the Street Lights Program. And we won't go into details about that right at this point, but I will say that when we were in Mexico in September, in Mexico City, we visited the Rebirth Foundation. We interviewed some kids, uh, and there are a lot of extraordinary kids there, really exceptional. But there were three that stood out for us. One of them is named Jonathan. He's a musician. He's 17. He's going to high school. He's exciting. He wants to create a band called Music to Escape Drugs. I think it's the name of it. He wants uh, to overcome drugs with music. He wants to get kids involved with music and, le and learning instruments and things for a, pop for, for a positive purpose. Okay? Great young man. young uh, man that we interviewed was a young man named Martin, and he's an incredible young man. And I actually first met him six years ago uh, when he was only 10 years old. He was at the shelter, and very friendly kid, very nice kid. I really fell in love with him. Great kid. Uh, past six years, I haven't seen him, and I don't know where he was or whatever, uh, but when we went back there last month, and we were interview interviewing this kid, he says he remembered me. I didn't recognize him. Because obviously, six years can change a child dramatically from 10 to 16. He's 16 now, he's tall, he's handsome, he's big, and a great kid. We asked him, well, what would you do if you had the means to run a, a project to help other kids around you? What would you do? And what, would you, what did he say? He said, I wanted to, to become uh, more clean. Sanitary, hygiene, sanitation, cleanliness is very important to him. You see him, you never think he was a street kid. He dresses well, he cares for himself, his room is immaculate. So he wants to give other kids the opportunity of learning what it means to be clean. Taking care of self-respect a lot. So he's creating a program that will develop self-respect for these kids. No esa fuerza, sino que para que tú vivas bien, porque a, a todos nos gustaría que entraras al baño y que esté limpio, ¿no? Yo entraba al baño, ¿eh? Y entonces, este... We also wanted to include a young woman. We don't want to make this exclusively for men, because a lot of women suffer to girls. They're especially victimized and exploited in many horrible ways. And there are girls at the shelter. One of them is named Christina. Beautiful young lady. Very mature for her age. She grew up in a very hard circumstances. So with many siblings, her mother, manic depressive, unable to function. And so she was basically the mother of the family, taking care of her siblings. And she had to come to the shelter because there was just too much abuse in the home. And things. But she's so mature. And we asked her, well, what would you do if you could help the kids at the shelter, the younger kids? She said, I want to be a teacher. And one of the things I learned growing up was that when I came home from school, there was no one to help me with my homework. I had to do it all myself. I thought it would be so wonderful if someone could help me with my homework. She wants to give back to others. She wants to help <coughs> other younger kids learn to love homework. Now, the thing about Mexico, Mexicans don't generally like to read. You don't see a lot of readers there. They don't care much for books and learning. 
Maybe there's exceptions here. We have Latinos and Axis here. Let me give you a But these are kids who don't have parental support. You know, uh, they're left on their own. Even the ones who still live at home, they're not getting the, the support that they need. She wants to create a program where these kids can come to her, she can teach them you know, their homework, inspire them, provide a way for them to learn how to read and to learn and to get out of their situation. Okay, well that's the possibilities that we're going to actually hear these kids tell them about their lives and what their dreams are. These are their dreams, real dreams. What you want to make it possible. More than anything, they want to go to school. They want to get an education. All education. I want to be somebody. I want to have an education. I want to be able to help others. Yes. More than anything. They want to go to school. And they recognize the value of education. It's essential because they will never leave the streets without education. And so here's an opportunity to help uh, kids to help themselves. Mm -hmm. Please bear with me. I will show part of a video that I made last year that kind of shows the relationship between leaders and the kids who follow these leaders. So for those who wish to remain for the next uh, 20 minutes or so, 15, 20 minutes, I will show part of a video, a movie I made last year. It's called Beacons of Hope. So it talks about the leaders that we, we work with in Mexico and Colombia, and the kids that have been most inspirational to us. One young man in particular, you see him in the movie, his name is Michelangelo Carillo. Michelangelo Carillo. Incredible young man. Let me just tell you a little bit about him before you watch the movie. This is a man who, as a boy, he ran away from home at six years old because his mother just beat him for any reason with an electric cord. He just beat him for any reason. He couldn't do anything right. So he, he ran away from home, lived on the streets for 10 years, and got involved with drugs, a few things he shouldn't have done. This is a kid, like we were saying, a kid who did not want to be a failure. He wanted to succeed. He wanted to have a better life. He knew that education was the key. He couldn't go to high school. He had no money, his family wasn't providing it. He survived for 10 years on the streets by going to families, by people like you, and just saying, if I, if I do housework, if I clean, if I wash the dishes, will you feed me? You know, just give me a meal, feed me, and I will do the work for you. That's how he survived for many, many years. Until he met Jose Vallejo, the man you've seen in the movie. President Perry has met him briefly. Incredible man, he's our hero. This, and when he met the Ecuador House, he asked him, the first question was, well, if I come here to live here, can you give me an education? Can I go to school? And he said, yes, absolutely. That's one of the things that we provide is public education. We will get an education. This kid, like a dry sponge in water, he soaked up every bit of education that he could. He, he, he caught up on years of school that he had missed in, in just a, couple, in a very short time. The shelter provides workshops where they can learn baking and printing and carpentry and various other things. Even an acting class. They even have an actor who comes in and teaches the kids acting. Everything he could learn, he was learning. Incredibly young man. This is we met him when he was like only 16, first time. Didn't speak English. But he wanted to change. Well, between the first year that we met him as a 16-year-old and the second year that we came back, when he was 17, he had been to Europe in Germany for one year on a scholarship. Why? Because after we met him, shortly after we met him, he entered a fencing contest. He had, he had met somebody, a German tourist, who, fencing coach. He says, can you teach me how to fence? Said, sure, why not? Took up fencing, entered a national fencing contest, won first place. <laughs> scholarship to Germany for one year. Well, that was his, his ticket out of poverty. He lived in, and so we didn't see him, well, we saw him the year after he'd come back from Germany, he's speaking German, he's excited, and he's eager to go on with life. And then after that, we didn't see him for five years. We didn't know what happened. We thought we was living in Europe, didn't know much about him. Last year when we went down there, we, we show up at the shelter, we turn in, and there he is, standing next to the shelter, overwhelmed. We didn't expect to see him. He didn't expect to see us. 
But we got to hear his story the last five years, and what an incredible story, how he lived in Germany, uh, lived in Ireland for two years, working in Ireland. Now he speaks good English. My new movie I'm making, so he, he actually tells what he's been doing the last several years. It's amazing. He met a French woman, fell in love. And he's, now he's married. He was engaged then. He's married a French woman. He's living in France. Speaks four languages. Incredible. Five languages. Five languages. And he still, and he actually never even finished high school. Now, see, but with a little bit of education, he took advantage of it. He went as far as he can, and he's still growing. This kid will be a millionaire years before I am. <laughs> he will. He doesn't see. He stands in his way. That's one of the things he said uh, when we first met at 16 years old. We interviewed him. He says, You know, I know I have traveled the, the stony path. I know I've made mistakes, and I'm tired of making these mistakes. Now that I have given up drugs, I don't want rocks to be in my way again. I don't want to be climbing over rocks. I want to be on a straight path. And that's what he's doing. Last year when we met him, we asked him, well, why did you come back to Mexico? Why? I mean, you're free. You escaped the streets. Why are you here? Well, he came back to renew his visa. But he didn't have to go to the Reaper Foundation. He could stay in a nice hotel, and whatever. He said, why are you here? He says, because these are my brothers and sisters. This is my family. See, he's giving back. He's a streetlight. So he's our example, our, the model that we use as a streetlight. Someone who will succeed and someone who will give back. Each other okay, whatever. And, and he was looking for this house. I met him around Sokal, in uh -huh. the city center. So he said, oh, listen, if, okay, if you can help me, I am looking for a house called Fundación Renacimiento. Oh. And I was like, what? <laughs> but I've lived there. <laughs> you know, like, I've lived there, okay? Yeah. I can bring you there without problem. Oh, seriously? And I said, yeah, of course. So it's the reason what I met him. And then uh, we start to get to know what he did, you know, and, oh. and he told me, like, he was like a... A fencing coach. Teach, fencing yeah. coach. So he has, uh, right now he has a school. Mm -hmm. So, and he started to teach me like these fancy things. Mm -hmm. And I started to love it. At the beginning it was just like to have fun. But then, then I, it was really because I started to yeah, appreciate serious. it, you know, like by seriously. And then, uh, or he started, where he, once they, his family came to Mexico, you know, and he asked me to go to Germany to, Germany to be, visit them. Uh, so I start to like try to get a job to get money to pay the ticket, you know, to go to Germany. And then I, when I went there, I start to learn, to learn more things like pentathlon. I don't know if it's say it's named like that in English, pentathlon. You know, like running. She oh, said, pentathlon. I don't know. Is it Pen sh pentathlon. Uh, shooting? Shooting. It's shooting. Yeah, different sports activities. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, like swimming, running. Uh -huh. Uh, what do you say? Uh, if you're welcome to stay, we'll start the movie. Okay, uh, can you start where you had uh, cute?